Uh, I want to thank Dr. Bilraj and the team for inviting me. Uh, it's wonderful to be back. I was here uh, not too long ago talking, talking to a surgical grand rounds, talking with some of the acute care and transplant surgeons, and I really enjoyed my visit, so was excited for the opportunity to come back. Um, as uh, you mentioned, I'm a trauma and acute care surgeon. I only practice surgery. I don't practice palliative care outside of my surgical practice. Um, I take trauma call, emergency general surgery call. Uh, I am also uh, an attending in our surgical uh, intensive care unit. And part of the reason why I became interested in this is because I did my critical care fellowship at Brigham Women's where I did my residency. And, um, you know, we are affiliated with Dana-Farber Cancer Center, which is uh, much like Methodist MD Anderson. We take care of very, very sick patients. And I found that I was the surgical oncologist in the middle of the night um, where the patient who has advanced cancer uh, comes in with a perforation or obstruction. And I realized that my surgical training and even my critical care training didn't really give me the skill set to deal with a lot of the issues that were influencing how my patients were making decisions uh, and influencing how they were looking at their trajectories. And then also helping me to transition patients to end of life care. And it was actually my interest in this and my interest in ethics that first led me to palliative care. Um, so that's a little bit about my journey, but you know, most of what I do is really within the context of being a surgeon. And, and we were talking yesterday, I mean, you know, I love a great save like everybody else. And so I don't look at palliative care as end of life care or something that should just be focused at the end of life. I look at it as an additional layer of support um, that my patients and their families can, can benefit from uh, because unfortunately the way that we deliver healthcare, I often don't have the time, uh, the skill set, or the bandwidth when I'm a surgeon um, to deal with all the issues that, that they're dealing with. So um, I am fortunate enough to have some funding uh, to uh, study this. Um, and so the objectives of the talk today are one, to understand why palliative care is relevant to surgical patients, two, to recognize the barriers to palliative care. Uh, and I think that's important if we're going to overcome some of those barriers, we have to recognize when we're, when we're facing them. And then three, to describe the role of palliative care in surgery, which um, I would posit to you is not an oxymoron, although many people may think it is. Um, so why is palliative care relevant to surgical patients? So this is Ellen, um, and this is not the real patient, but it is based on a real patient. Uh, Ellen is an 82-year-old who is a former smoker. She has mild COPD. Uh, she has hypertension, she has coronary artery disease, she had a stent uh, about three years ago. She's got chronic renal insufficiency, her baseline creatinine is about 1.4. Um, she has peripheral arterial disease. She has mild diabetes, which is well controlled with oral medications. She's got congestive heart failure with a preserved EF, so her EF is um, about 60%. And she has some mild cognitive impairment. Uh, she is able to live at home because she has a very attentive daughter. Um, but she has some functional dependence. She can't do all of her independent activities of daily living by herself. Her daughter does her shopping for her, her cooking, but she's able to, to bathe and toilet herself. Um, the problem is, is that she has difficulty with walking. Uh, her walking is limited by shortness of breath, um, but it's also limited by increasing pain that's been refractory to medical management. And it looks like her peripheral arterial disease is worsening. And so this is a patient who I think is probably very familiar to the people in this room uh, and somebody that I also would see as an emergency surgeon. Um, and her daughter, uh, you know, is very committed to her mother's care. She's an only child. Um, and she says that she wants absolutely everything done. Um, and she promised her mother that she would never have to be in a nursing home and that she would always take care of her. And that commitment is very important to her. They've never talked about end of life care or advanced directives other than that, other than mom, I will take care of you and nothing bad will happen to you. So she proceeds and she gets um, her lower extremity revascularization and her post-operative course is marked by delirium. Um, she starts to aspirate and she develops an aspiration pneumonia. She's get, she uh, is put on a fluoroquinolone, she receives lubriquin and then she gets C. diff. She has profuse diarrhea and now she's malnourished. She's <clears throat> delirious and um, a recommendation is made for her to have a feeding tube. So she has a feeding tube that's placed. Um, she's eventually sent to a SNF and then one week later, after a three-week hospitalization, being discharged to a SNF, one week later, she comes back with a breakdown of her surgical wound, and she is readmitted to the hospital. And so we are going to see more and more patients who look like Ellen. Um, the largest growing segments of our population are 65 and older, and the oldest old, so patients who are over the, the age of 85. Um, and what we know is that a third of all surgeries are performed in patients who are over the age of 65. So <clears throat> what I tell my surgical residents 
um, is that if you didn't want to go into geriatric medicine, then you were obligated to go into pediatric medicine because that's what's happening everywhere else. So you need to understand what it means to take care of older patients, no matter what your specialty is. Um, and we know that of Medicare decedents, so patients who die, 35% um, of them will have surgery in their last year of life. Um, I'm sorry, 33% of them will have surgery in the last year of life. That of those who are in their 70s, almost 40% of them will have some surgical procedure in the last year of life. And of people in their 90s, 15% of them will have a surgical procedure in their last year of life. So we understand that end of life care has to be relevant to surgeons. We also know that when we compare decedents who have surgery and those who don't, um, decedents who have surgery spend more days in the hospital, they spend more days in the ICU, and they're readmitted to the hospital more frequently in their last year of life. And so it is becoming increasingly important for us to make sure that the treatments that we provide are aligned with the what, what our patients want and what they expect, what their goals and values are. There's increasing attention uh, among the public about how patient, patients live or people live their last years um, and how they die. We also know that the Institute of Medicine recently uh, published a report called Dying in America that implored all clinicians who take care of seriously ill patients, and that's patients who have a life-threatening illness, who I would imagine is everybody in this room, to become skilled at primary palliative care, um, to understand how to communicate with patients, how to treat symptoms, how to deal with basic end-of-life care needs. And we also know that as we move to acute accountable care organizations and bundled payments, we are going to be more concerned as healthcare systems about trajectories of care as opposed to discrete episodes of care. We're going to be judged by how the patient does overall as opposed to that one hospitalization. But it's not just about dying. You know, for patients, they want to know that they can live independently. They want to know that they can do the things that they want to do, the things that they've always wanted to do. They want to know that they're going to be able to spend their time with loved ones. And they want to know that they're going to be able to reach important milestones. And so these are important things that we need to address with them when we make decisions about treatment. Now, Terry Freed, who is a uh, geriatrician, uh, did a survey of 250 older patients with serious illness. And she asked them, you know, if you could have a low burden treatment that's going to improve your quality of life, what's, what's the chance that you would take that treatment if you had a high risk of death versus a high risk of functional impairment versus a high risk of cognitive impairment. And when she put a scenario to them where they could get a low burden treatment that would improve their quality of life, but there was a high risk of death, 80% of them said they would take it. But when she said there was a high risk of functional impairment, that dropped to 30, 36%. And when she said there was a high risk of cognitive impairment, that dropped to 33%. And so what I learned from this is that for some patients, there are things that are, there are fates worse than death, but also that I can't assume. I don't know because none of those are 100% and none of those are 0%. And so I have to ask, I can't presume that I understand what the goals of treatment are. Now, I don't need to tell this audience that cardiovascular disease is a major contributor to morbidity and mortality in older patients. Um, and that it's not just in cardiovascular disease. In surgery, cardiovascular disease is the base risk, risk factor for morbidity and mortality for non-cardiac procedures, right? But when we look at cardiovascular disease, whether it's congestive heart failure, you know, valvular disease, or peripheral arterial disease, you know, these are chronic illnesses. They're insidious, they're progressive. Um, the treatment is not curative. Um, it's not curative. And so many of these procedures are intended to prolong life, but also to treat symptoms. And so they meet the definition of palliative procedures. There's a high mortality associated with these conditions in the short term and in the long term, and obviously it gets higher as the illnesses progress. The, prognostic is, uh, the prognostication is very uncertain, right? The course is undulating. Patients get worse and they get better. They get worse, they get better. But over time, they generally get worse. The trajectory tends to be on a downward slope. And in the advanced stages of illness, there's a very high symptom burden. Patients experience chronic pain. They have fatigue. They have functional dependence, increasing fun functional dependence, which causes social isolation, depression, anxiety. And so this is how patients experience their illness, not just their lesion. And that in the advanced stages, there's a lot of caregiver distress that is associated with cardiovascular disease. So even if, as a general surgeon, I am taking care of patients with these conditions, I have to recognize that there is a trajectory that they're on that may be separate from their cholecystitis or from their colitis or from their appendicitis. That in fact, I need to recognize where, where they are in their illness trajectory. 
And even when we're looking at doing aggressive, you know, potentially life-saving interventions like cardiac surgery, we have to recognize that there's mortality associated with that. So this was a cohort study that was done actually at a hospital in Dallas, a tertiary center in Dallas, looking at um, beyond 30-day mortality in cardiac surgery, um, which I, I know is an issue that I don't want to get into. <laughs> that being said, um, I think it's important to look at you know, what happens after the 30 days. And what they did was they stratified outcomes by discharge location. So patients who went home, rehab, skilled nursing facility, or a long-term acute care facility. And I think what you see here is that even after patients leave the hospital, there is continued residual mortality over that first year after surgery. And it actually levels out after that first year. And I'll tell you that this trajectory is very similar to what we see in emergency general surgery patients as well. That there is high mortality that first year after surgery, and then it levels out. But if you look at patients who are discharged home, they actually do okay. Patients who are discharged to rehab and SNF continue to have mortality, and the outcomes for patients who are discharged to long-term acute care are actually quite poor. And so if we look at outcomes aside from mortality, how many of them are home and alive at one year? So patients who went home, 95% of them are alive at one year, home and alive in one year. But if we look at patients who went to rehab, that drops to two thirds. If we look at patients who go to a SNF, that drops to just above half. And if we look at patients who go to LTAC, less than a third are home and alive at a year. This is important information to share with patients and families. It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't do the procedure. It means that it will help them to plan for their future. So what does palliative care have to do with this? This is a summary of the WHO definition of palliative care, um, which says that palliative care is an approach to care that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early assessment and treatment of pain and other symptoms, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. But the way that I look at it is that palliative care really just makes patients feel better. That's really the purpose of palliative care. And there are eight domains, domains that we think of in palliative care that are included in palliative care. And so that includes symptom management. Uh, it includes psychosocial support, spiritual support, um, care transitions, um, advanced care planning and decision support, end of life care, and bereavement support. And I think what's important about that is that one of seven is end of life care and everything else is about what happens before patients die. And so we in palliative care are not focused on end of life care. Um, and so we, we need to make that, that um, apparent to other clinicians. The other thing that's really important, it's important for us to educate ourselves about this, but also to educate our patients and our family is that palliative care is not hospice. They're different. So hospice is an insurance benefit. It's a payment model. It's a payment model for how to receive payment for palliative care for patients who have a limited life expectancy, right? So most palliative care can be given to any patient with a serious illness. Hospice is for patients who are near the end of life. Um, hospice just determines how you're paid. And unfortunately, to receive hospice, the benefit of hospice, you know, most of the time, patients have to forgo life-sustaining treatments, okay? But in palliative care, curative care, life-sustaining treatment can be delivered at the same time. The other difference between palliative care and hospice is that most hospice is actually delivered at home, whereas palliative care is often in the inpatient or outpatient clinical setting. So they're quite different, um, and they have different uh, populations, and, and they meet very different needs. And it's important that we um, are very careful in our language so that we don't confuse that for patients and their families. And so if we're looking at how we should deliver palliative care, right, we should deliver it alongside curative and restorative care if we go back to that WHO definition, right? I mean, isn't the objective to make patients feel better? The problem is, is that I'm a surgeon, so I am focused on the ulcer. I am focused on the gallstone. I am focused on the ruptured appendix, right? I'm not focused on the whole patient, right? I'm not necessarily thinking about, well, this patient, you know, forget about the older patients, this 45-year-old man who now has a perforated appendix and now has an IR drain and is now on IV antibiotics because he became bacteremic is going to be out of work for six weeks and can't support his family. Right? That's not what I'm thinking about, but that's what he's thinking about. That's what his difficult wife is thinking about, right? That's why every time she, I walk into the room, she wants to yell at me because she wants to know when he's going to get out of the hospital and get better because she doesn't have help at home. She doesn't have any money coming in, right? He's an hourly worker. They're terrified he's going to lose his job, right? So this is how our patients experience illness, and don't we want to address that at the same time? And because of the way our medical care has evolved, many of us just don't have the time or the skill set to do that. 
Um, so obviously in the course of illness, the reason why I like this diagram is because it also recognizes that, you know, most illnesses have an unpredictable and kind of undulating course, right? And that as the illness progresses, palliative care takes a more primary role, um, but not until uh, much later on. And when patients feel better, they live longer. So this was a groundbreaking study that was done by Jennifer Temmel, who's a thoracic oncologist at MGH, uh, looking at providing early palliative care for patients who had non-small cell lung cancer. And you know, this was kind of the first headline, New England Journal, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Um, you know, a lot of people got a hold of this. And, and basically what it showed was that if you deliver palliative care alongside standard curative or, or um, you know, standard cancer treatment, patients actually live longer and they feel better. And so this is a Kaplan-Meier curve of patients who receive palliative care uh, compared to patients who receive standard care. The patients who receive palliative care had outpatient visits, an average of four visits uh, over the course of 12 weeks, but some had one visit and some had 12 visits. It was variable depending on what the patient needed. Um, and what they found was that the patients who had palliative care, let's see if I can find the pointer, lived longer. They lived longer, but they also reported better quality of life, they had better mood, and they had less aggressive treatments at the end of life, even though they lived longer. And so this study has been replicated in other cancer patients. It's also been replicated in hospice patients. So there's a paper uh, by Ziad Obermeyer and a team at Dana-Farber looking at patients who had pro poor prognosis cancers. Um, and they looked at the type of diagnosis and they looked compared patients who were uh, referred to hospice early versus those who received hospice late or not at all. And the patients who received hospice early lived longer. And it just in tech, in, intuitively, it makes sense that if you feel better, you're probably going to live longer. So the benefits of palliative care have been demonstrated in a number of populations. And I know that in heart failure, um, there have been mandates and directives about including palliative care, even though the ed evidence specifically around heart failure is actually not all that robust. The trials that have been done do show that there's uh, improved symptom management, um, but in, uh, improve, improved symptom management and decreased depression and anxiety. Um, but, you know, the, the jury is still out as far as the quality of those studies. That being said, there are a number of studies that show that palliative care reduces symptom burden. It reduces length of stay, both in the hospital and the ICU, uh, that patients who have received palliative care have less intense treatment at the end of life. There's more care alignment. So patients are receiving the kind of treatment that they say they want. There's less conflict in the ICU among caregivers uh, with the family, better quality of life at the end of life, better outcomes for survivors. So less um, complicated grief and bereavement, reduce costs, and all of these studies show either improved survival or no increase in mortality. So there are no studies that show that palliative care increases mortality. Now, that being said, right, people don't publish those studies, but there are studies, there are no studies that show that there's an increase in mortality. So who is eligible for palliative care? And I think this is something that comes up, you know, I just never know when to call palliative care. I don't know when they, they should be involved. And so Diane Meyer and David Weissman came up with some criteria for um, patients who should be screened for palliative care, at least when they're admitted to the hospital. And there are other criteria for outpatient evaluation, et cetera, but I think this is probably helpful for this audience. So there's one thing that we use in palliative care as a screening tool called the surprise question. And really the surprise question is, would you be surprised if this patient died within a year? Um, and you know, in a number of different populations, so including cancer, heart failure, nephrology, and we've just published something in emergency surgery, it's actually pretty, pretty good. It's, pre it's pretty good predictor. It's about 50% predictor, and it actually matches a lot of prediction models in each of those specialties. So if you wouldn't be surprised if the patient would die in within a year, there's a pretty decent chance that they could be dead within a year. And so these are patients who are at least candidates for advanced care planning, right? Um, so potentially life-limiting illness and the surprise question. Frequent admissions, so, you know, the frequent flyer, uh, the patient who's repeatedly coming back, particularly for the same illness. Patients who are admitted because they have uncontrolled symptoms, you know, so cancer patients who are admitted with uncontrollable nausea, uh, uncontrolled vomiting, um, and then poor performance status. Patients who are in bed for more than 50% of the day, or even patients who have increasing functional dependence or um, have a new onset of functional dependence. So what are some of the barriers to palliative care in surgery? I'm sure if I asked the audience, everybody would raise their hand. And <laughs> have something. But these, these are a few that, that I've thought of. And I don't think that these are unique to surgery. It's just I'm a surgeon and this is what I know best. Um, but, um, you know, if we look at it from the patient proxy and the clinician standpoint, I think from the patient perspective, right, they often, at least in surgery, they may lack capacity to make decisions on their own. 
Um, they may be in denial or they just don't know, they don't understand the implications of their disease. And there's a lot of confusion, as I mentioned earlier, about what palliative care actually means. From the proxy perspective, they're often anxious. They don't know what, about the patient's illness. Um, and they're often unprepared to make decisions for somebody else. Um, and they too have misconceptions about palliative and end-of-life care. And then from a clinician standpoint, you know, oftentimes we're afraid that we lack the skills. The conversations are difficult. They're uncomfortable. Um, I was teaching my residents the other day and I was, you know, trying to talk to them about, you know, some of the difficulty in initiating these conversations with ED. And I said, you know, it's kind of like when you're going to break up with somebody, right? Like everybody knows that you're going to break up with this person, right? Everybody knows that you're in a relationship that you don't like. Like your friends know and everybody, and they're the last person to know because it's a hard conversation. It's never the right time. You know, it's like, well, we were going to go on vacation, so I didn't want to break up with him then. Or, you know, we were we, we were going to go to his sister's wedding, so I didn't want to break up with him then. It's like you just keep putting it off because it never feels like the right time, even though everybody around you knows that the relationship is failing. So it's that same kind of reluctance to engage in a difficult conversation that we find as clinicians in talking about some of this stuff. Um, and there's also uncertainty, right? You know, what if, it, what if I really shouldn't break up with him? What if he is the one? What if I never find anybody else, right? So there's the uncertainty of maybe, maybe they'll get better. You know, maybe they'll get worse. And I would say, and this is what we were talking about yesterday, that embrace the uncertainty, and it's because it's uncertain that we should engage in this stuff, right? It is the uncertainty that causes the anxiety. It is the uncertainty that causes the distress for our patients and their families, and embrace the uncertainty. Don't be afraid of saying, I don't know, but I'm worried, right? What if? This doesn't work out as we plan. We're going to continue on this course and doing everything we can to get you better. But let's just think for a minute, what if? You know? Um, and then there are time constraints, right? Those are difficult conversations. I will say when I was a palliative care fellow, um, you know, as a surgical attending, I might do 15 or 20 consults in a day. As a palliative care fellow, maybe I did five. You know, the whole concept of time is very different in palliative care than it is in other busy, especially interventional-based specialties, right? You know, they're built on time. I'm built on how many procedures I do. So I think it's really important to keep in mind that there are other people who can help with this. And then, of course, there are silos. It's difficult. What if the cardiologist said there was a different prognosis than I did? You know, we don't want to contradict each other. Um, in surgery and interventions, often there are complications there at the root of this. And then, you know, we have to be honest with ourselves that referrals are important. And you don't want to be the surgeon who says, you know, who is always talking about death, right? That, that's not a good way to build a practice. The other thing to keep in mind is the surgical covenant. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that um, comes up in my life as an intensivist is that people will say, well, why do surgeons have such a hard time with drawing life support? There's this frustration. You know, like, why can't they just get it? Like, this patient is obviously dying. What is the problem? And the fact of the matter is that this is personal. You know, particularly when it's related to complications, it's personal. You know, and, and I will tell you that I have had complications as a surgeon that I know have killed people. And that is really hard. It is really hard and they don't want it to happen, right? So it feels terrible. And this covenant, you know, is basically, I'm not going to, once we agree that you're going to have surgery, I'm not going to abandon you. You know, I'm going to battle death for you. And this is part of my identity as a surgeon, right? This is part of who I am. This is part of what I do. And there's great personal sacrifice, right? You know, I was with you at two in the morning on Saturday instead of my family, you know? So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to have done all that and then let this just go. And so you have to understand that it's personal. So instead of approaching interventionals and other clinicians with frustration, I, you know, say approach them with compassion and understand that they are suffering and that this is hard. And if you've been taking care of a patient who has heart failure for seven years, right, it's hard to say goodbye. So, you know, to, to the supporting people, you know, support that person, be a partner. Um, you know, and this bears out in the literature. So this is a, a survey that was done by Gretchen Schwarzy and her colleagues at the University of Wisconsin, um, and <clears throat> looking at the role of surgeon error in the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment in the ICU. And so they did a survey of over 900 uh, surgeons who routinely perform high-risk surgery, uh, including cardiovascular, cardiac surgeons, vascular surgeons, and, uh, and transplant surgeons. And I'm sorry, neurologic surgeons. And what they said, they gave them <clears throat> a clinical scenario and they said, you know, here's the clinical scenario. And if the family and patient requested a withdrawal of life sustaining treatment two weeks after surgery, would you agree? And so if you look here on the left at the dark blue, if the cause of the withdrawal of support was related to a surgical complication or a surgeon error, a little more than 30% said that they would agree. If it was not surgeon error, more said they would agree, almost 40% or a little over 40%. If the surgery was elective, then again, a little more than 30%. If it was emergent, 
again, around 40%. And so if you combine them, the cause and the timing, um, if it's not surgeon error in the dark purple over there, and it's not, and, and I'm sorry, if it's surgeon error and it's elective, then it's fewer than 30% so that they would agree to withdraw a life-sustaining treatment after two weeks. But if it's not surgeon error and it's emergent, like I didn't know the patient, we had to go, not my fault, all bad, it's above 40%. So here you see evidence that, you know, surgeons are reluctant to withdraw life-sustaining treatment when they feel some personal responsibility for the outcome. That being said, you know, I think that probably the most remarkable finding here is that it's fewer than 50% for any of them. And so while I think that it's a double-edged sword, right, you want your surgeon to be your advocate, you want them to have agency, you want them to want to battle death for you. At the same time, this is a huge threat to patient autonomy. Um, and so we really have to think about the implications of this. And my colleague, Roger Schwartz, has described this as surgical buy-in, which is <clears throat> surgeons often think, well, you know, you agreed to the procedure, and that means that you agree to everything that comes with the procedure. Um, and we've done a lot of work actually tape recording conversations between surgeons and patients and analyzing them and recognizing that that um, buy-in is not at all explicit. You know, that, that surgeons don't necessarily describe that that's their expectation, nor do they describe very well what the uh, potential complications could be. <clears throat> and I don't think that's unique to surgery, it's just that's who we happen to record. I think another challenge for palliative care in surgery is that, you know, from the palliative care standpoint, surgery is very different than other illnesses uh, that we see and other patients with serious illness that we see. And so if you look at palliative care in surgery versus chronic serious illness, and I'm including uh, congestive heart failure and cancer as chronic illnesses as examples, uh, you know, the trajectory is different, the presentation is different, decision-making is different, bereavement, death outcomes, all very different in surgery. So, for example, the trajectory in surgery is will they die, whereas in cancer it's when will they die, right? So there's a sense of planning for an inevitability. The presentation in surgery is often very different, right? Complications, um, frequently it's not the surgery. Surgery went fine, but their heart failure, you know, or their COPD, I can't get them off the ventilator, but everything else looks great. Um, or chronic critical illness. So the patients who are in the ICU now for weeks can't get off the ventilator or go into an LTAC. Whereas in you know, other chronic illnesses, it's often the expected course of the terminal illness. Uh, Decision-making of surgery is often sudden. Uh, there's a surrogate to deal with, um, and there's no established relationship between the clinicians and the patient or their family. Uh, ideally, in chronic illness and palliative care, the decisions are made over time. It's an iterative process. Uh, there's an established relationship, and the patient can be engaged because it happens uh, upstream. Uh, bereavement is often a sudden loss, um, whereas, you know, the, in chronic illness uh, and in conditions like frailty and dementia, the loss is gradual, right? So, you know, over the course of a year, mom's function is getting worse. You know, she can't do the things she used to do. She can't think of the things she used to do. She doesn't recognize me anymore. And so you're, you're losing that person over time. And so that oftentimes when they die, um, it's much more expected. And unfortunately, and sometimes it's a relief because you see the end of their suffering. Um, death in surgery is considered failure. Um, death in chronic illness, I would say less of a failure. I, you know, <laughs> um, it's still very hard for us as a medical, you know, establishment to kind of come to terms with the fact that death is a normal part of life. Um, we still see it as a failure, but it's less of a failure. Um, but the outcomes in surgery and palliative care are certainly different. The outcomes in surgery are around morbidity, mortality, uh, blame, and M&M. &M. Uh, there's been a lot of work about the uh, importance of M&M &M. Uh, in developing surgical culture, right? So it's what did you do? You know, why did you make that decision? It's a very personal series of questions. And there was a study actually comparing surgical M&M &M and medical M&M. &M. Uh, medical M&M &M was much more focused on systems issues and quality, whereas surgical M&M &M was much more, um, much more personal uh, and direct. Um, and then in palliative care, our outcomes are peace and quality of life and bereavement outcomes. So it's, it's a different perspective. And so how do we mold the two together? And so I think that we as surgeons also need to educate our palliative care colleagues about how they can best support our patients and support us. So looking at palliative care and surgery, what is the role of palliative care and surgery? So I think, you know, it's really important that we start, you know, thinking about procedures that aren't going to just treat the problem or fix the lesion, you know, or, you know, release the clot or move the clot. It's how do we help the whole patient? And again, this is more of what our patients are going to demand of us. And so I think that there are a number of areas where palliative care can be really helpful. And one is with goal setting. So explaining prognosis, prioritizing treatment goals, uh, decision making, so talking about code status. You know, more and more patients who, older patients are more likely than others to have advanced directives. 
Um, so about a third of older patients who come to the hospital have some sort of advanced directive. Um, there is a misunderstanding about the um, implications of DNR. So what DNR means is that if your heart, if you get so sick that your heart were to stop, you don't want it restarted um, through unnatural means. You want to die a natural death. That's all that that means. It doesn't mean you don't want surgery. It doesn't mean you don't want pain medicine. It doesn't mean that you don't want to go to the doctor. It doesn't mean that you don't want to go to Disney World. It means that if you get so sick that your heart stops, you don't want somebody pumping on your chest. So, you know, patients who have DNR orders want surgery. And in fact, there was a study in the National Surgery Quality Improvement Project that looked at patients who had DNR orders. There were almost 5,000 of them um, over a period of about four years. And most of the procedures were major elective procedures. So more and more surgeons and anesthesiologists are also going to have to deal with patients who already have DNR orders. The conversations already happened. And how do we deal with that in that context? Um, but then also decision-making around alternatives to treatment. We have to stop thinking about surgery or whatever intervention it is that we're offering is doing something, and palliative care is doing nothing. Um, perioperative care, so symptoms around surgery and then family and caregiver support. Uh, recovery, again, readdressing symptoms uh, and readdressing uh, treatment goals. So we, um, I worked with um, some colleagues of mine in, in our research group, and we were thinking about models of surgical appropriateness. So Surgical appropriateness is, is something that um, is of tremendous concern to hospital leadership, uh, to folks who focus on quality. You know, how can we think about, how do we define what is an appropriate procedure? And if we look at it historically, you know, the way that we've looked at it is the right operation, right? So is this carotid endarterectomy indicated for this, you know, this uh, indication, you know, for this degree of carotid stenosis, right? Um, is it the right provider? Is that patient, is that provider board certified? Um, how many operations have they done? Um, do they have the skills to perform the surgery? Do they need to go to simulation? Do they need CME? Right? And then we think about the right hospital, right? So accreditation, joint commission. Is this, you know, a high volume place that has the facilities in order to deal with it? But, you know, up until recently, we haven't really thought about appropriateness with the right patient, right? Does this patient have the decision-making capacity? Do they have the social supports? Um, how do we make sure that the patient's expectations will be met by this procedure. And so in procedures that have a high degree of uncertainty, but also are very high risk, shared decision-making is the preferred way of treatment as opposed to informed consent. And they're very different. And shared decision-making is really dependent on the patient's goals and values um, and, and understanding that, um, you know, what their priorities are for healthcare. But this is hard. This is very, very hard. And uh, my colleagues and I did kind of an exhaustive review of the literature looking at communication uh, that um, precedes the intensity of surgical treatment, right? Because it's about a conversation, right? That, you know, we can talk about all these different ways that um, surgeons decide to have surgery, that patients decide to have surgery, but ultimately it's all predicated on a conversation. And there are different factors that go into this. There are patient factors, surrogate factors, surgeon factors, and system factors, and it's very complex. And so from the patient perspective, it's a lot of what I already mentioned, you know, medical understanding, the acuity of their illness, their personal attributes, their uh, experience with, with the healthcare system, how many times have they already been told that they were going to die and they made it through, right? Um, from the surrogate perspective, you know, their own medical understanding, their personal attributes, their ability to deal with uncertainty, but also how many times they heard the patient was going to die and they made it through, right? Surgeon factors, a lot of the things that I discussed already. And then the system factors, uncertainty, fragmented information, the EMR. I mean, we just got Epic as well. And you can't, we couldn't find, it's very difficult to find what anybody's advanced directives are um, initially. A lot of work had to be done around that. So how do we streamline systems of care so that the information is readily, readily available? But there are, are shortcomings of advanced directives, right? I mean, even when patients do have advanced directives, they may be difficult to find. They haven't discussed it with their surrogate decision maker. Um, oftentimes they're either too broad, like I don't want to be in a vegetative state, or they're too specific. Um, you know, two doctors have to decide that I have, you know, a month to live. I mean, it just, um, they're not necessarily related to the context in which we find ourselves. And so we did some qualitative um, uh, analysis of some interviews that we did with some acute care surgeons to ask them how they have these conversations. How, how do they go about having these conversations and making decisions about high risk surgery in older patients who have serious illness? And this is a quote from one of them that I think um, says it really nicely. And, and they said, you know, it is about a conversation. I think if you don't have some framework about how aggressive the family and or patient would want to be and don't have that conversation on the front end, it becomes a bit of a slippery slope and it continues on. And sometimes it can prolong 
the dying process. And so my colleagues and I uh, convened a panel of experts in palliative care, anesthesia, surgery, emergency medicine, um, quality, um, geriatrics. I'm trying to think. It was, it was a very um, broad, multidisciplinary panel of, of critical care medicine, of people to help us think, like, what should the components of these conversations look like? How do we provide that framework to surgeons and other clinicians who are confronted with these situations? And this is what we came up with. And we're actually doing um, some pilot testing right now, some simulations with surgeons um, and helping to do this with, with standardized patients. So it's been very interesting. So these are the questions that we kind of came up with, and this is the framework, and it won't be unfamiliar at all to anybody here who practices palliative care. But when trying to make a decision for treatment, I think the first thing is to develop a shared understanding of what the patient's trajectory is. Right? So what do you understand about your illness? Um, and then educate them so that they do understand that you have a shared understanding of what, what their illness means, um, what the expected trajectories might be, and what do you hope to achieve with this treatment, right? So if Ellen says, well, you know, I want to be able to live independently, I don't want my daughter to have to help me at all, there's a lot of reasons why Ellen is functionally dependent that don't have to do with her leg pain. So you have to make sure that you clarify that up front so that her expectations um, are, are met. I worry that things could get more difficult. Acknowledging that, you know, progressive chronic illness um, often has a downside, you know, um, and what could we do um, in that case? Who's making decisions for you? What are the things that are most important to you? When we're talking about a specific treatment, I think it's really important, you know, often we talk about goals and values. We have to address patients' goals and values, but that doesn't really mean anything. Really what we're trying to get at is what are the trade-offs? You know, what are you willing to go through, Ellen, to not have leg pain? Are you willing to go for a four-hour surgery? Are you willing to get blood transfusions? Are you willing to go to the ICU? Are you willing to have a three-week hospitalization? Are you willing to have delirium? Are you willing then to go to post-acute care? Right? Because that's what I expect could happen after you have surgery. Right? Are you willing to go through all that to have leg pain? And if the answer is to not have leg pain, if the answer is yes, that's fine. And if it's no, well, then let's talk about that. Let's talk about what those things mean. And so then based on that, I recommend and I can't emphasize this strongly enough, we abdicate our responsibility to patients and families by not making recommendations. They rely on our judgment, but those recommendations have to be based on the information that we hear from them. It's not just about illusion, it's about the impact that it's gonna have on their overall quality of life. And then no matter what, we'll support you. You know, oftentimes, um, you know, patients and families really have a lot of distress and a lot of fear that if they don't accept medical treatment, then they won't have access to the medical system. You know, what happens if I stop coming to the doctor's appointments? Then who's going to take care of me? You know, who's going to, who's going to address my symptoms? What happens if I, if I say no? You know, will you still like me? That relationship is really important, is really important. So there is evidence to show that palliative care um, does benefit surgical patients. And so um, this is a study that was done uh, in the VA, um, and it was actually looking at palliative care consultation after they implemented a frailty screening program. So all patients who had general surgical procedures in the Nebraska VA, um, and then they implemented a frailty screening program and they um, compared 150 patients before implementation and 100, and, I'm sorry, 160 patients before implementation and 150 patients afterwards. And what they found was that there were more preoperative palliative care consults once they implemented the frailty screening. So you've you know, done something to identify, right, to screen for who might need some palliative care, right? Could be the surprise question. They found that there were fewer operations. That's not really a surprise, right? But what they also found was that there was lower mortality from the operations that were done, right? So there was 50% lower 30-day mortality and 30% lower 180-day mortality. And I would say that's because they were picking more appropriate patients, right? So the right people were getting the operations and so the outcomes were better. And so we did a systematic review looking at palliative care interventions for, system, for um, surgical patients. We reviewed uh, almost 9,000 abstracts um, and we found 22 interventions that met our criteria, criteria, which were basically that there was an intervention, there was a control group, and that kind of thing. Uh, over 8,500 patients were included in all of these studies. Uh, and what we found was that the outcomes from these studies, four studies showed lower mortality with palliative care, um, four showed improved symptom management, and seven showed lower cost utilization. Those were the positive findings. There were, the negative findings were neutral. There was nothing that showed worse mortality or higher cost. Everything else was neutral. Um, so, you know, the direction is positive, although the quality of the data is poor um, in that they were single center studies, many of them were retrospective, and so, you know, to, to your point, my life's work is to fix that. So, going back to Ellen, 
So if we go back to Ellen, I, you know, kind of looked at her case and, and I used some risk calculators that you can look up on the web, right? One of them is ePrognosis. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. This is a prognostic uh, calculator that's right out of UCSF, um, looking at geriatric, um, uh, looking at geriatric outcomes uh, with respect to multimorbidity. And they compare community dwelling elders versus nursing home patients, and, and it's um, been validated um, prospectively as well. And so her one-year mortality, according to ePrognosis, is 30%. So the answer, the surprise question is, no, I wouldn't be surprised, about a third. Um, her operative mortality, using the NSQIP risk calculator, was about 3%. That's reasonable. Her risk of a serious complication is about 30%. Her risk of any complication is about 32%. And so, you know, again, I would say, I wouldn't be surprised if she died within a year. I also wouldn't be surprised if you have a complication. So we probably have to talk about all those things, too. Her expected length of stay was eight days, but that was if she didn't have a complication. But then, of course, she did. All right. So what would a conversation look like with Ellen? I think if we were using some of the palliative care principles to have a preoperative discussion with her and her daughter, um, you know, it would be, what do you understand about your illness? You know, this is per peripheral arterial disease. It's progressive illness. It's happening in all parts of your body, right? Because you already have coronary disease. It's related to your smoking and your diabetes. Um, and you also have this COPD. You also have some mild cognitive impairment. We don't expect that to get better over time. We're going to do everything we can to help you live as long as possible, but we don't expect that that will get better. So what do you hope to achieve from this operation? So, you know, you want to have less pain. We hope for that too, you know. Um, but again, this will give you less pain, but it's not necessarily going to cure your peripheral arterial disease. So, you know, it may progress in other parts of your body. You know, I worry that things could get difficult after surgery. So, you know, chances are you, you won't, I did this calculation and chances are you won't have a complication, but, you know, I worry that you could. Um, things that I would worry about would be delirium, confusion after surgery, pneumonia, um, you know, you might have difficulty swallowing. And so we should probably talk about how you feel about having a feeding tube or have, being on a ventilator or being in an ICU for a long period of time. We should definitely talk about who makes decisions for you and make sure that you have conversations with them about, you know, what kind of health care you would want if you got sicker. Um, you know, what are you willing to go through? I hear that you don't want to have pain in your leg and, and you know, that's absolutely my goal. And that's what I hope for. But it's helpful to understand, you know, what your cutoffs are. So, you know, you, you never want to live in a nursing home. Okay. You know, so we should think about that as we're making decisions for you along the way. Um, but based on everything that I've heard, I would actually recommend that we continue with the surgery. That we do the surgery. Um, but, you know, after the surgery, if things change or if they don't turn out as we expect, we're gonna, I'm going to keep everything that you said in mind. And I'm going to make sure that we respect you know, what your wishes are and, and the things that you hold to be most important. And if it looks like we're not going to be able to get to an outcome that you think would be acceptable, then I think we might have to have some conversations with your family about that. But our goal is absolutely to keep moving forward and to extend your life as long as possible. But no matter what, we're going to support you. And, and if you don't mind, you know, I, I imagine that it's really hard for you and your daughter, you know, with all that's going on and your serious illness. And so it would help me um, if we could engage some of my palliative care colleagues to help us take care of you better, certainly while you're in the hospital, but it might help you after surgery as well. You know, some people confuse palliative care with end of life care. And, you know, this isn't because I think you're going to die. I think it's because I recognize that this must be taking a toll on you and that I think that your symptoms might get worse over time and they can be really helpful with that. And they can certainly help me think about better ways to support you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. That was a, a good overview for a reality check on, on everything they'll be doing. I think no better coming from a, a surgeon, and as I said in the, on that cruise of term, uh, any questions open for questions? I enjoyed very much your, your talk. Two things uh, from a practical point of view. One, how do you introduce palliative care to a patient that you've been taking care of for so long with the concern that, you know, there's an, this abandonment or something like this. Uh, two is following that, if you introduce palliative care to them, 
how good it really is the continued communication between the palliative care team, which I know they're very sensitive to, and the physician who's been taking care of this individual for so long. So I think um, there are two important points. So the way that I introduced palliative care is actually the way that I said that I introduced palliative care. I need help. These folks are really good at symptom management, and they can help address some of the things that are hard for you and provide you an added layer of support that I can't do. Um, and I need help, and I want to make sure that we're taking care of all of you. And you may find that it will help you or not, but do me a favor, see them. That's really how I introduce it. I'm not abandoning you. This isn't changing anything that I'm going to do, but maybe they can help us. And, you know, there may be some difficult decisions that we may have to make along the way, and that might help having an additional team come in and help. So it is, you know, the purpose of palliative care is not just to support the patient, it's to support the entire team. And I really lean on that to kind of take it off the patient. Um, and I emphasize that I'm not going to abandon it. Um, from the practical standpoint, I think that, you know, um, you know, when I said barriers to palliative care and I kind of made that list of all of the differences between, I mean, palliative care clinicians need a lot of education about what the needs of the various subspecialties are. And we were talking about that last night. I mean, for better or for worse, I think palliative care is going to start to mirror other types of care. And so there are palliative care clinicians who specialize in heart failure. And there are those who specialize in cancer. Um, I'm hoping there'll be a group who specialize in trauma and surgery um, because the needs of those various populations are quite different. And the needs of those clinicians are quite different. And so, you know, much of palliative care is rooted in cancer. Most of the work in palliative care has been done in cancer. And a lot of it was, you know, really around symptom management, around chemotherapy. And so it's grown. Um, and I think that, um, you know, so for example, <clears throat> where palliative care clinicians often see that they can be most helpful is in symptom management, because that's the default palliative care, is symptom management related to cancer. Um, and that's how we're trained. Um, but, you know, for, for many of us who are consulting them, we actually need the goals and the decision making, and, and that's where we need the most help. And so we need to educate them about what our needs are and improve communication both ways. I think, you know, I think that we have an expectation of palliative care um, that is different than other um, specialties. So, for example, if I were to call a cardiology consult, I would not say, I only want you to deal with the F, I don't want you to deal with the blood pressure. But when palliative care got consulted, you can only deal with symptoms, don't talk about goals, right? And so we need to have better communication about what our objectives are, what our concerns are, and talk to them first about how they can help us. Um, so I think there's a lot of dialogue and a lot of conversation. I think that there is a sweet spot, but we both have to work to get it. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. That was really a terrific talk, uh, Zara. Um, my question is, Is there are, what have you done in your institution to implement this? Uh, are there formal curricula for house staff? Are there, what, what kind of uh, educational environment can you create? Not in the study environment, but actually just in the practical, how do you do this? Right. So we have, um, so getting palliative care in our institution has been very difficult, in part because of our relationship with Dana Farber. So palliative care up until now has only been, or up until very recently, has really only been through Dana-Farber, and much of it has been just for cancer patients, and there's been a shift because we have a new chief of palliative care. So it actually has been very hard, and so it's been a lot of me banging my head against the wall and educating and, you know, pulling my residents in when we're having the conversation and being very clear with my colleagues about this is the conversation that I had last night. You know, so it means taking the extra time to be like, this is the conversation that we had last night. Make sure that we're all on the same page with the patient and the family, not just kind of leaving it to sign out between residents. Um, as far as the house step goes, I do a ton of education, but one of the things that has been really, really helpful for us um, is we have um, started a geriatric co-management model on our trauma service. Um, and so all of the residents obviously will rotate through the trauma service. And, you know, geriatricians are outstanding at providing palli primary palliative care. And so, you know, and it's also been much more acceptable um, to many of the faculty to have a geriatric co-management model as opposed to a palliative care co-management model. And I'm saying, I don't call it care what you call it as long as we do it. Um, and so that has also been very helpful in, in helping both faculty and house staff risk stratify so we have a frailty pathway, so now we're identifying patients who are frail, you know, which means that there's a lot of education about what the implications of frailty are. You know, there's a lot of education now about what the implications of the geriatric uh, uh, syndromes are and also, you know, what the symptoms are that those patients experience and how we can address them. So, you know, we're doing it 
um, kind of in, in through our processes of care, um, but also through the education that's required to change those processes. Uh, Dr. Cooper, based on what what you presented, it almost seems like every patient who comes to our hospital probably needs to have this palliative angle, right? And in in the in the want of time, in the need of time, and in the busy clinical world, it does make sense for a special team to see these patients. And the question becomes on the remuneration models and the billing timing and scalability. And I don't know if at the national level or in the reimbursement side, is that something that's scalable for the palliative team to self-sustain, uh, or is it does it become a mission? For the hospital to invest in, and I don't know if. Yeah. Uh, so nationally, there's a lot of a lot of talk about this, and I, I was mentioning yesterday. And this is something that um, you know you might be aware of, Dr. Bass. But you know the uh, American College of Surgeons just received a grant from the Hartford Foundation to develop um, kind of standards of care for geriatric surgery. So much like the American College of Surgeons has the Commission on Cancer or the Committee on Trauma, which verifies trauma centers or cancer centers. Um, you know, there's a push towards verifying geriatric centers. One of the things that I'm excited about is that, um, you know, if, if you become a trauma center, it requires that your faculty have a certain amount of CME, a certain amount of um, continuing medical education, that your nurses have medical education. And so, you know, my hope is, and we're working hard to build this into this new model, that there will also be a requirement for geriatric um, end-of-life care um, CME and continuing education for nurses and for surgeons who are caring for these patients, right? And as I said, all surgeons except for pediatric surgeons deal with older patients. So there's going to have to be some kind of certificate, like an ATLS or something, that will come along with that. Um, and, and the reason, to answer your question, the reason why that's important is because there will never be enough palliative care clinicians. And a lot of this is stuff that, you know, they're, in palliative care, we think about primary palliative care and secondary palliative care. And a lot of this is stuff that we need to be able to do. So, you know, as a surgeon and as, um, you know, an intensivist, as we talked about yesterday, like I, if somebody has arrhythmias, I'm fine. I'll put them on an AMO, but after that, like it's all you. Like I call for a consult. And so we have to figure out how to make it the same way that, you know, there's certain stuff that surgeons need to know how to do, um, or people who are caring for seriously ill patients need to know how to do, which may even just be approaching, you know, do you have an advanced directive, which many of us are loath to do, just asking that and then opening the door for somebody else to come and, and do that. Um, you know, Medicare has started to reimburse advanced care planning conversations. Um, and so that is now a billing code. Um, and one of the things that's exciting is now that it's a billing code, we'll actually be able to track how it's used. Um, but it, any clinician can use it. It's not restricted. So any clinician can do it. It doesn't have to just be palliative care uh, providers who do that. Um, so, you know, that, that reimbursement model will come up. I don't think, you're right, everybody needs criteria. I think we have to be parsimonious about who we do it for. But I think that we have to stop saying, you know, either everybody needs it so I can't do any of it or you know, denying that there are a group who definitely need it and would benefit from it. The other thing that I want to mention, we talked about it again a little bit last night, is there is this expectation that we have that these conversations are, um, you know, that, that it's a one-time event, you know, and that's just not true. This is an iterative process that goes on over time. And so, you know, one of, I think one of the frustrations often with a palliative care consult when they're called in at the 11th hour is, well, why didn't you get the get? You know, why is the patient still, you, you came to see them and the patient is still full code. I'm never calling a palliative care consult again because you people are useless. You know, but in fact, that's not how this works. It's a process. It takes time. And if, you know, you're going to wait until, you know, you expect the patient to die tomorrow to tell them they could be dying. I mean, nobody's going to get that, you know. And, you know, if you just think about other things in life, like retirement is supposed to be really fun, right? I mean, retirement is supposed to be good and nobody plans for retirement. So why are they going to plan for this? You know, so I think we have to just kind of change our expectations about kind of how we expect people to come to terms and accept things. Um, and that's part of the reason why we have to start it earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.